Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to have you here. What a whirlwind weekend it has been. But uh, you are the true blues here coming uh, all these services. And I really want to thank uh, Nancy and Mary and even Tim doing the, the filming or the videotaping, whatever that's called. It's not videotape either, is it? But uh, just all the extra effort that everyone has uh, put in. But we're still happy that you could be here on this first Sunday uh, after Christmas and we can again join our voices in worshiping uh, and praising our Savior, our Lord and our King, Jesus Christ. Uh, this morning, uh, even as we're still basking in kind of the afterglow of our Savior's wondrous birth there in the little town of Bethlehem, what Luke's Gospel does for us today is it zooms us ahead 12 years and we find Jesus being 12 years old. And after they visit the temple there in Jerusalem and they're beginning their trek back to Nazareth, it appeared to Mary and Joseph that Jesus was lost. Uh, he was missing and uh, for several days. They were already a, journey, a day's journey from Jerusalem and then there was another three days that they were looking for him. But in reality, Jesus was exactly where he was supposed to be, right there in his heavenly Father's house. And when they find him there, boy, there's Jesus kind of in the middle of all of them and uh, the teachers of God's word, and they're marveling over how much this young boy, Jesus, knows about the scriptures. So that's what we're going to focus on today, and we too uh, will marvel at the growth of Jesus in our sermon based on that gospel. Uh, we'll, we're using Rite 41 as our order of worship, and we'll begin with an opening prayer. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for the sake of Christ. Amen. Let us now turn to hymn 134, and we'll sing together, let us all with gladsome voice. So we turn back to pages 41 and 42 as we continue with the confession of sin. Let us bow in spirit before the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
O most merciful God, you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for us his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue then with the Kyrie eleison. Lift up your hearts unto God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To all who believe on His name, He gives power to become the children of God and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest. Almighty God, in mercy, you sent your one and only Son to take upon himself our human nature. By his gracious coming, deliver us from the corruption of our sin and transform us into the likeness of his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We continue then our worship service as we now focus on the written Word of God and the scriptures that have been printed on the back of your bulletin. So on this first Sunday after Christmas, we now turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, beginning with verse 4. The Lord God gave me a tongue like the learned, an instructed tongue, so I know how to sustain the weary with a word. He wakes me up morning by morning. He wakes up my ears so that I listen, like the learned. The Lord God opened my ear, and I myself was not rebellious. I did not turn back. I submitted my back to those who beat me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and from spit. The Lord God will help me, so I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have made my face hard like flint. I know that I will not be put to shame. The one who will acquit me is near. Who can accuse me? Let us take our stand. Who can pass judgment on me? Let him approach me. Look, the Lord God will help me. Who then can declare me guilty? Look, all of them will wear out like a garment, a moth will consume them. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson comes to us from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, beginning with verse 10. Certainly it was fitting for God, the one for whom and through whom everything exists, 
to bring the author of their salvation to his goal through sufferings. For he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified all have one Father. For that reason, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. Within the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will trust in him. And again, here, am I, here I am and the children God has given me. Therefore, since the children share flesh and blood, he also shared the same flesh and blood, so that through death he could destroy the one who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For surely he was not concerned with helping angels, but with helping Abraham's offspring. For this reason, he had to become like his brothers in every way, in order that he would be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, so that he could pay for the sins of the people. Indeed, because he suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of our Lord. So today's gospel lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. And as I had mentioned earlier, we're going to focus on our gospel lesson. And so it will be read at that time. So let us now turn to page 46 as we confess our Christian faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Page 46. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our sermon hymn, it has been inserted in your bulletin. We'll sing together to your temple, I draw near. Well, peace to all of you and grace from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, as I've already alluded to earlier, today's gospel lesson uh, is the text for today's sermon, and I invite you to rise for this gospel reading. Every year, his parents, now we're referring to Jesus, traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. When the days had ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. Since they thought he was in their group, they went a day's journey. Then when they began to look for him among their relatives and friends, then they began, excuse me, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? See, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. He said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be taking care of my father's business? They did not understand what he was telling them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth. He was always obedient to them, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and with people. Thus our text, and we pray. Well, Lord Jesus, even at 12 years of age, you were zealous for God's word. And in all that you did, you served as our perfect substitute in accomplishing what we could not do so that salvation and eternal life would be ours through you and your work. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 
Can you even imagine what must have been going through the minds of Joseph and Mary during this particular journey back to Nazareth? I mean, what a roller coaster ride they were on. As they set out from Nazareth with Jesus, apparently making his first visit in Jerusalem there at the temple, since he was an infant, perhaps his parents were quite excited and very proud. Jesus had grown up now from being a babe in Bethlehem to being this young man. And he was now old enough to, to participate in God's established religious festivals. And he could do it for real. Very likely as they arrived in Jerusalem, they were reminded of the events of Jesus' birth just 12 years before. They maybe remembered their time in the stable and the prophecies of Simeon and Anna when they brought him to the temple and then the visit of the Magi. To bring Jesus back to the area of Bethlehem and Jerusalem, it likely stirred up those old feelings of mystery and wonder with perhaps some awe and some humility mixed in. And then... Jesus goes missing. The Son of God they cannot find. Can you imagine the panic and the dread that must have seized them? They search frantically for him among their relatives and all the other people who were there setting up camp that night. And then after they didn't find him, they had to go back to Jerusalem as quickly as they could. And that was a day's journey. And even so, they had a full three days of searching for fear to just take hold of their hearts before they finally found Jesus. And how they must have felt had our Lord's reaction, which amounted almost to, or maybe actually, a rebuke, even if uttered in gentle and respectful tones. This is what I mean by what a roller coaster ride for Mary and Joseph. But whatever Mary and Joseph had thought about Jesus for these past 12 years, these events surely made them reevaluate everything. They too had been astonished at his understanding and his dedication and his willingness to follow his Heavenly Father's will and mission even at such a young age. And as they pondered the situation, they also must have wondered about how this young man had grown up right in front of their eyes and also be so wise well beyond his years. That's the same thought that we too want to ponder today as we learn of the boy Jesus, and we are encouraged to marvel at the growth of Jesus. And perhaps first and the first and biggest mystery to us as we ponder that thought is the fact that Jesus needed to grow in the first place. After all, we recognize Jesus as the God-man, the Word made flesh. And while our puny earthly minds can't completely understand how Jesus can be 100% God, 100% man at the same time, we can comprehend on a basic level that this means that Jesus was and is God who actually became a human being. And as God, Jesus needed nothing. Not instruction, not maturing, not supervision, not development. This is God we're talking about here. And yet, here we see Jesus humbly following the dictates of his human nature. He was willing to learn to walk and talk and read and write, to obey his parents and to conform to the restrictions of his human nature. 
And what did the last verse of our text tell us? States very clearly, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. And when we hear that, we, we might just balk at such a thought, at first anyway. But that verse is so obvious and clear that even though our minds can't fully grasp it, we accept it. And actually, we marvel at it. Jesus became like us, including being bound to growing and maturing, just like we must do. Now, the next thought is just as mystifying and profound. Jesus even humbled himself to devotion and instruction in God's word. What? Yeah. Although Jesus is the very word of God. Remember from John's gospel, it begins, but he begins by telling us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then just 14 verses down from that, he reveals that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's talking about Jesus. And yet here, Jesus allowed his human limitations to require of him personal study and memorization and growth in the Holy Scriptures, the Word. See how mind-boggling that is? And yet that's what's happening. And this was such a high priority for Jesus that he valued it above traveling back to Nazareth, showing a devotion to God's word that superseded all other roles and responsibilities. And there he sat, there in the temple. He's listening and he's answering. He's unashamed and even willing to rebuke his earthly parents for questioning his priorities, which were correct and upright in his heavenly Father's sight. So there are two things that I'd like for you to take away from our discussion here at this point. The first is this deep sense of wonder and awe that the king of heaven would be willing to go to grammar school and Sunday school. All as a part of his work of redeeming you and me and this world. And secondly, is the deep need that each and every one of us has for God's word. You see, fellow believers, according to Christ's human nature. Jesus had no higher priority than to be close to his heavenly Father. And how do you do that? By studying his holy scriptures. And God, you see, intends the same blessings and the same strength for all of us. But unfortunately, here's a sad reality. We actually devalue our Savior's work when we refuse to follow in his example. Or we convince ourselves that we've learned enough already. I've had all of that. I went to Sunday school, confirmation, whatever. I don't need any more growth, at least as hard as the Savior himself did. Now think of that. Let's put it a different way. If even the holy, innocent Son of God valued growth and study in God's Word, then shouldn't we frail and weak sinners recognize our need for that growth all the more? And as you ponder that question, it is absolutely critical that you let God's law and gospel carry out their work in your heart. Now that question I just ask you, first it rebukes us, doesn't it? For our lack of devotion and dedication. And how? 
Well, it convicts us for our unwillingness to spend time in personal Bible reading at home or in Bible class at church. And it exposes our sinful attitudes toward God's Word. We might th not think of it that way. We might not think that we ever have any sinful attitudes toward God's Word. But that's what happens when we don't value it as highly as we should. Don't skip over those thoughts without letting them sink in and think in. And I want to say that again so that it doesn't just go over the top of your heads. Don't skip over that thought without letting them, those thoughts, without letting them sink in and think in. How am I valuing God's Word? The reality, we should be studying God's Word more than just, say, one hour at Sunday services each week. Because, see, here's the problem. When we neglect God's Word in this way, we sin. And we must admit this to ourselves as well as to our gracious God. Secondly, we want to see the value that Jesus had for God's Word and learn to imitate his example. But since our sinful human natures prefer to ignore God, it's good for us to fight back, to fight that uh, sinful nature and to beat it down and place the same premium on time in God's word that our Savior himself had. Not only that, but here God is teaching us that he gives his word to us as a gift. And it's intended in that word to enlighten us and strengthen us and bless us. Like a much needed drink of water for a thirsty soul, we learn to use God's word for the help and the blessing that God is actually built in to that word for our benefit. His word is the living word of God, and it's the very fuel our faith needs to grow strong in wisdom and love and in the health of our own souls as well as the souls around us, especially those who have been placed in our care. Kids, grandkids, as well as others. Listen to his word. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest his word. Remember those phrases? That was part of our, uh, one of our uh, Lutheran liturgies where we prayed that together, seeking to have the word of God dwell richly in all of us. Now, I get it, as I'm preaching to you about this text, there may seem to you that there's a lot of do this and do this and do this with God's Word, which sounds like a lot of law, which it is. And one might ask, where then is the gospel in all of this? Well, not surprisingly, we find the gospel right there in the person of Jesus Christ, our Savior. In our text for today, our Lord's obedience and dedication to growing in the Word is actually part of Christ fulfilling His mission to be our perfect substitute. The Gospel. Follow me on this. Jesus is fully dedicated to God's word as part of his being, the perfect lamb of sacrifice who takes our place on the cross. Everything that we're supposed to do but have failed to do, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, did it all for us. Never failing once, never sinning once, his sacrifice wasn't uh, to pay for his sins. He didn't have any. 
until hanging there in agony on that cross. As the Apostle Paul informs us in his second letter to the Corinthians, that God made him, now he's talking about Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. So it was there on Calvary's cross that Jesus took upon himself your sins and my sins and the sins of this whole world and paying for them in full with his suffering and death. And it was his perfect obedience that covers all of our disobedience. And his blood washes away all of our sins, including our sins of neglect and disinterest in God's teachings. This is why we should all marvel at this 12-year-old Jesus here in our text. He's already taking our place through his obedience as the Holy Lamb of God, our true substitute and Savior. And so, dear friends, as you marvel at watching Jesus grow in wisdom and stature, don't make the mistake of thinking that God doesn't intend the same thing for each of you. That he doesn't intend for you to grow and grow. Or that you don't fall into that trap of thinking you don't need to grow. I, I know pretty much what I need to know. God says, no. I got a lot more for you in my word. Now, yes, our Lord's resurrection from the tomb means for us and for all believers our own resurrection. A resurrection to a new life to be lived out now in Christ and a never-ending life that is to come that is filled with everlasting joy and happiness. We got that. But always remember that Jesus set you free from sin along with its eternal punishment in order for you to be able to live in God's presence without that fear of punishment. But it goes even further. He has freed us to live our lives in absolute awe of what God says is good. And in our new natures in Christ, what he loves, we love. And what he wants of us, well, that's what we want as well. So precious ones in Christ, set your minds to grow. To grow more and more in God's word. And in doing so, you'll find more and more details about the Savior's work that went into saving you for eternity. And the more reasons to love him with your heart, mind, and soul in return. Yes, fellow believers, marvel at the growth of Jesus and then be ready to marvel as his word makes you grow in your faith too. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I don't think we have any visitors here today. You all know the routine. If you haven't filled out the card, we invite you to do so, if you haven't done it already, and then just place the card in the offering plate as it at the conclusion of our service. And uh, we'll continue with prayer. I'll just mention that I got a um, phone call, might have been Christmas Eve, I'm thinking, from uh, Linda Hamry. Some of you may be keeping contact, but uh, they uh, had a bout, both of them, with COVID. 
but they have uh, survived that. I think they're on the men pretty much, but um, their nephew, who actually lives in Fertile, um, I was thinking about him as you talked about your 51-year-old niece. I think she said their nephew was 51. He also contracted COVID and passed away from that. So we'll keep them in our, in our prayers, uh, as well as uh, Linda Stewart. I don't know if you know her sister and son and uh, her uh, father, or no, um, brother-in-law, thank you. <laughs> I'm getting the families mixed up there, uh, the members. But uh, they all came down with COVID and uh, he passed away from that as well. The mother and the son are still battling it, but I think they're getting better. So we'll keep all of them. And I know uh, Bev Densmore had a number of nephews and nieces too that have come down with COVID. So we'll keep them in our prayers. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, once again, we have enjoyed the privilege of gathering in this house of worship to hear your holy and precious word. May its message of salvation through Christ stir up our hearts to faith and love. And may it empower all of us to produce the full fruits of good works that you intend in our lives. May we not forget your word, which we have heard or bring shame upon it, or by our lives speak against it, or our hearts not believing it, or our lives not obeying it. Keep your word in the minds and hearts of our loved ones, not present with us here today, and return them soon to fellowship also with us. And through the Spirit, open the Scriptures more and more to our understanding, that we might know you better, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save us. Father, we greatly need the comfort that your word provides. We know that we are by nature sinful, and our flesh is continually opposed to your will. We often find that we act against your commandments, doing the very things that you forbid and neglecting the things that you command or desire of us. We readily admit that we, are, we justly deserve eternal separation from you in hell, but we plead for your love and mercy, which is revealed uh, to uh, this world of sinners in your word. Let the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord, blot out our sins from your memory and present us faultless before you. Our only plea is that you forgive us for Jesus' sake. There is nothing that we desire more than eternal life through his merits and his mediation. Father in heaven, from your word, we know that your heavenly throne is a throne of grace and that Jesus, our Savior, intercedes for us there. And it is to your throne that we come, burdened with our worries, cares, and our needs, our sorrows and troubles and illnesses. Envelop us into your loving arms and hold us near by your counsel and aid and relieve us of our many burdens according to your will. Dear Father, we continue to lift up to you Linda Stewart's sister and her son who have been battling against this COVID virus. Be with them in this struggle, providing them with your healing hand and if it be your will, that you would spare their lives and enable them both to recover fully and to go forward in their faith and their lives. And please bless them with an extra measure of your grace as well as they grieve the loss of husband and father to that same disease. Grant to them healing for their hurting hearts that only you can provide. We also want to thank you for blessing Dick and Linda Hamry as they too recently endured the, the ravages of COVID. We thank you for their recovery and also ask that you would bless them as they too are grieving the loss of their nephew who recently succumbed to that disease. In all of these cases, Lord, and the others, uh, the Densmore's families as well, who are suffering, we thank you for the faith that you instilled in their hearts, enabling them to turn to you 
in faith for help, for healing, and for salvation. Keep them and all of us and all of our loved ones safe in your gracious care. We know you are a God so gracious and merciful, so near to us when we pray, and so quick to respond to our pleas. Why then should we be fearful or anxious about our futures? Dear Father, according to your own promise, bless us now and always for Jesus' sake and in whose name we ever pray. Amen. And now we pray together as our Lord has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For our closing collect, we turn now to page 57 in your hymnal. Page 57. And as you go there, let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, Lord God, the Father, that you have given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you have borne in your sacred body all of our sins, and by your blood have blotted out all our transgressions. We thank you, Lord, the Holy Spirit, that you have created in our hearts through faith, that we know of nothing to trust for our salvation except Jesus Christ and him crucified. O oh God, grant us your grace that we may perfectly believe that all our sins are forgiven for the sake of the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so enlighten us by your Holy Spirit that in the power of our Redeemer's death, we may day by day put off sin and never forsake the Lord Jesus Christ until we see him face to face in life eternal. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. And now with hearts that have been blessed with saving faith, receive our Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant to you his peace. For our closing hymn, we turn to uh, our second inserted him, may the grace of Christ our Savior. Again, we're happy that uh, all of you could join us uh, this morning in our worship and praise of our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. And it's always our prayer that you have been strengthened in your faith 
through the proclamation of God's word and also receive encouragement through the fellowship of fellow believers. Thank you, Nancy, for providing uh, the music again for our worship. We so appreciate that. And to you too, uh, Mary, we thank you for sharing your gifts with us and uh, blessing us. By way of announcements, uh, there are a few of them. We don't have a lot going on this week. There's no confirmation class. And next Sunday, there's no Sunday school or uh, Bible class. Then on January 9th, we'll return to our regular uh, Sunday schedule. And January 9th's a big uh, 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 day too because it's when all of those reports are due to Linda for our annual report. Uh, so keep that in mind if you need to fill some things out yet for Linda's uh, report. It's also the day that we will um, install our new officers uh, or the church officers for 2022. Isn't it weird to say that? 2022 already. So, uh, and then the reason those reports are needed in, uh, so that they can be printed up and passed out for our annual voters meeting, which is scheduled for January 30th. Thanks to all of those who provided poinsettia plants for our uh, sanctuary and helping to beautify it for our Christmas celebrations. And you can take them home today uh, after our service. Any other announcements, Linda, that need to be made? Just be sure that you read the others uh, that are listed in here. Yes. Oh, that's right. Thank you. So there are plastic bags behind here if you want to use those to um, uh, take your plants home. It's just a little under 70 degrees out there. I checked right before the service. So you might want to use those plastic bags. So I want you to always remember, uh, dear ones in Christ, of our gracious God's love for each and every one of you personally. And he does forgive you. And may he richly bless you in your daily walk with him. God bless you. I'll usher you out.